So I have uh, a list of six lightning talks here already. Uh, if you want to do a lightning talk today, um, I'm quite happy to add you on to the end of the list if you've got something prepared want to talk about. Come and find me up here. Um, I'm going to uh, say the, I'm, I'm going to put, um, no, I'm going to announce people like one talk in advance. If you can come up here and get mic'd up, that would be fantastic when I call your name, um, if you are presenting a lightning talk. Um, so for those of you who have not seen these things before, lightning talks are five minute talks. Uh, people can talk on any topic they like. Uh, we have um, we have another lightning talk session tomorrow at the same time. So if you like what you see today and think that you can do better, you should sign up on the form that will be available uh, at the registration desk tomorrow. Uh, so like I said, we have six lightning talks today. Um, our second one is going to be from uh, Tim uh, Penhay, so if you can get up here and get mic'd. But first, Graham Dumpleton, who's going to tell us about running Jupyter Notebook in the cloud. Okay, who, who runs Jupyter Notebook? Good, we have a few. Um, who runs the cloud? It can be a pain. <laughs> we have lots of clouds in New Zealand. Um, it can be a pain getting uh, Jupyter Notebook rough and running. Now, I'm going to run this up very quickly on uh, OpenShift, which is platform as a service. And I don't have much time, so we're going to do it quickly. So, give it a name. Where am I New Zealand? So I'm going to start that up, and that's going to go away. Now, OpenShift is built on Kubernetes and Docker, um, so you can basically bring any image in here that you can use uh, with Docker and run it. I'm here using uh, an IPython Jupyter Notebook image. Now it's going to run it up. Now it's going to take a moment, so I'm going to go up and run another one for a moment, uh, just so I do overlap and have my time going. I'm going to run a second one over here. And we'll type in the correct spot and hope it. Okay, back to here. Okay, so my first one is now started up. I've actually got a Jupyter Notebook image up and running now, and that's going to work for me. And it happens to also be password locked, so I gave it a password. <laughs> nice and secure. Please don't go to that URL and try and do anything bad. Um, so I can go and upload an image there straight away and run up. Come on, quicker. So I've got my notebook image and running. Um, now, what's more interesting though is, is that's just one. And right, you can do that with 10pinB or other, other hosting services out there. Azure has got these ways of running it. That other thing I ran up uh, is actually IPython Parallel. And I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a way of actually running up a a whole cluster of end compute engines sitting behind a Jupyter Notebook. So I ran that up at the same time. I got one controller and I got one engine. I actually go, oh, let's just run up. How many engines do we need? Eight. I'm just going to spin them up. Um, and that all start up nice and quickly. Uh, this is all running on an a OpenShift cluster in Google Compute Platform. Um, I don't know, four, probably four machines at least or some other. Anyway, meantime, I can go over here. I can start going through my little uh, thing here. Now, let's see how many we've got running so far. Oh, we've got four running so far. Let's have them do it again. Five. So I'm getting, I'm not quite up to my eight yet, but let's keep going. And keep going down. How many's up? Oh, looks like six or seven now. And I can keep going down. So what I'm going to do here is going to run a job, which is actually going to run a task across all of eight running now. And run it. What's it going to show? And that's gone and run there. And I can keep going. That was, that was uh, one particular way of doing it. So in that quick amount of time, I don't know how many minutes I took, not many, I have started up Jupyter Notebook. I've started up a uh, parallel compute cluster. I've spun it up to eight nodes and run a job across that. Uh, how many more minutes have I got? Many? You have two minutes to shut everything down. No, okay, let's do another one. Let's quickly do another, start off another one and I'll explain at least what it's doing. Now in that particular case, I loaded up my notebook manually. Uh, what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to say, here's a Git repo with my notebooks on it. I'm going to actually start that up. Now what's going to happen this time is that in the previous case, I was just running up a pre-existing Docker image. I, I, I lo up, uploaded the notebook myself. This time what it's doing is actually going to download that uh, Git repo which has my notebook image in it, and is actually going to build me up a new image which incorporates that notebook. And that, it doesn't in this case, but I could have in that git repo a requirements.txt file. 
And what this will do is it'll go on down, install all those Python packages into that image as part of that, along with my notebooks, so that when I run up my notebook, all those One Python minute. packages that were required are in place and it will all just work. And you can do it the same for that computer engine as well. So very quickly, I can uh, do things now. This is just going to take a little bit because it's doing a build. So I'm not going to finish in, in the five minutes. So I'll leave it at that. But if you're interested in, um, in talking about iPython, you can come and talk to me. If you're interested in OpenShift, I forgot to bring it up. I have a book. I have some books to give away on it if you're interested. Um, so come see me about that afterwards as well. And enough. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Graham. So, uh, Chris Main, if you can come and get yourself mic'd up over here. Uh, up next, we have Tim Penhay, who wants help uh, with colorblind people. Yes. Great. So, um, at work, I'm working on um, a, a command line tool. And one of the things we've started doing is integrating color into our command line tool, um, you know, with, with success and failure and being Normally, ably sighted, we're using red and green and yellow, which is not great for people that aren't so um, able sighted. So first question, and I thought, since I'm going to be in front of a lot of people, and about 30% of the average male population is colorblind to some degree, I've got a collection of people that might be able to help. So put your hands up if you are partially colorblind or full colorblind somewhere. <laughs> okay, so now that you've identified yourself, um, I'm actually looking for help because I'm trying to choose some colors that will be good for people that are colorblind in some degree. So if you can come and find me at some stage over the weekend, all I want to do is sit down and say, what color looks good for you to indicate an error? What color looks good to indicate success? Or if you're completely colorblind and just use grays, perhaps we'll investigate using bold or something like that to indicate differences. That's all I'm after is I'm trying to make our tool work for people that are colorblind. That's all. So come find me on the weekend and we can work and try and make something useful. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Tim. OK, uh, so up next getting mic'd is not Tom Eastman. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Chris Main is going to tell us about Codecraft Dunedin. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Uh, a very quick uh, lightning talk for me as well. Um, I've asked a few, P few of me I've already met today and said, oh, are you from Dunedin? Do you happen to know about Codecraft? And everybody has said no so far. So um, in the spirit of thing, Codecraft has been running for a few years now. Um, we're a local developer group. Um, we currently meet down in the Polytech buildings. And uh, you will have seen, uh, heard the mention of Eureka. That's where we go afterwards. Um, so the meetings are every Tuesday, um, 5.30 to 7 at the moment. First Tuesday of the month, sorry Tim. Um, first Tuesday of the month, uh, 5.30 to 7, and we talk about a range of subjects. Personally, um, I've already spoken to Tim about it, but uh, Lucy's talk this morning was pretty inspiring, and I'm looking forward to sort of um, maybe taking on some of those ideas to get it, but it'd be really good for all of the developers that I've met in Dunedin. Um, you know, reach out to us, or if you're interested in coming along, that would be great to see you. The thing that has always staggered me, I, I helped organise some of the earlier early meetings a few years ago. And the thing that staggered me, there was a question today, and Lucy talked about um, why, you know, how can you do that in a smaller centre? You know, can this work? It, it'd be great to be living in a Sydney with developer talks to choose from and choose which flavour. Not quite so easy here, but really in Dunedin, there's a surprisingly large IT scene, and we really don't, don't communicate between ourselves as much as, as, much as we should. Um, so, you know, I, I, I sort of rough around, I'd organised the talks for a year or two, and I could find a new IT company in Dunedin every single month to introduce themselves. It's really interesting what's going on in the town. So um, I encourage you all to come along. Thank you very much. Uh, you appear to have a... Ah, there is one way to do it. You'll see I've got no slides. We've got no website. There's a meetup group, Codecraft Dunedin. That's it. And, uh, you appear to have a second talk on this list. I do. You have yes. three minutes left. Ah, I only get three minutes of both. I will do that talk tomorrow if you like. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> uh, right, so uh, Marcus Holderman, if you can come and get mic'd up here. And we're just going to wait for our next speaker to uh, try, and make, uh, try and make the tech work.
At, at PyCon AU, I would normally be embarrassing them by running the timer down while they try to get stuff connected. Um, but we have plenty of time here today, so... Oh, um, it's no fun if you don't rush me. Uh, right, so uh, we have... So uh, we have... Um, Serialization formats are not toys, which is going to be presented by not Tom Eastman. Hi, who's seen this talk before? Who hasn't seen this talk before? Excellent. It's a half hour talk. I'm going to do it in five minutes. That's Tom Eastman. I'm not Tom Eastman. I'm not Tom Eastman. You're not Tom Eastman. Tom Eastman is over there. Serialization formats. Why am I talking about this? Loading data into your app is the most boring part of your day. You just want to get your data into the thing and then you want to do the cool stuff. The problem is that 90% of magic merely consists of knowing one extra fact. If I know how I can get into your system through your various things, uh, through bugs and not features, then I can ruin your day. This is me with my uh, hacker hat on. Um, everything I'm going to be discussing today is a feature, not a bug. This is going to be fun. So. Here is a sample bottle app. All I'm doing is I've got a couple of different um, endpoints, one for YAML, one for XML, and one for LXML. All it's going to be doing is loading in the data and displaying it back on the screen. So let's talk about YAML. Parsing YAML is really easy. It's a really nice human readable format. And what it does is I can put in my first name, last name, and email, and it'll bring it back to me. That's fine. What you can do by default in YAML is you can apply Python objects. So I can live instantiate date time and it returns a nice date time in my YAML. What else can we do? Well, I can also uh, use uh, subprocesses and system calls. So I can import the contents of my uh, current directory using ls. And that's wonderful. I really want my users to be able to do that. How far can I go? Well, we could always just uh, load uh, <laughs> os.systemrmstar and then destroy the entire presentation completely. Uh, that allegedly happened when he was trying to prep for this. So surely this doesn't happen in real life, right? It happens all the time. Uh, it happened to Tasty Pie back in 2011. Uh, happened to Rails twice. Um, happened to Puppet, who really should have known better. And then it happened to Node and no one cared. So, how do you protect yourself? You make the parser stupider. You really do not want your parser to be able to load system libraries. You really don't. And if you think you do, you really don't. So, you need to use yaml.safeload, which is absolutely obvious because if you're going to be typing into a IntelliSense uh, compiler thing, you're going to put in yaml and then you're going to put dot and then you're going to think, what do I need? L load and you're going to hit the first one instead of the one that's down near S. Um, you can also do this in Ruby by monkey patching it. <coughs> <laughs> this is a scary enough slide on its own. <laughs> so entities, you can have smiley faces in XML just like you can in HTML. We use ampersand hash and then the uh, Unicode character combination so you can have a smiley face. That's nice. What you can also do is you can define an element that refers to that smiley face. So if I have the uh, smiley, I refer to it with the name smiley. And then what you can do is you can have a smiley, which is a bunch of uh, smileys, and then you can have an S3, which is a bunch of S2s and a bunch of S4s, which is a bunch of things, and then you can have all the smiley faces you want. But does anyone recognize this? Hands up. What is it? Yes, it's not the 1 billion last attack, it's the 138 million last attack because that's as much as could fit on the screen. And he should know because he wrote the slides. Um, he also tried to load this in Emacs when he was trying to write this talk and his laptop exploded because Emacs likes to load the XML for you and parse it. I use Vim. So. Stop clapping, she only has a minute. Oh, okay. Uh, what can we do? We can also do things like we could say traverse the local file system or somebody else's file system. Uh, don't do this. Um, surely this doesn't happen in real life, right? It happens all the time. This is XML. We use XML in enterprise. Enterprise runs as root. So how do you protect yourself? You just do a few little things to get our XML working properly. Um, but you need to make the parser stupider. You can do a bunch of things. All these slides are online. I'll tweet out a link later. You can do stuff with diffused XML. How, how long do I have? 45 seconds. Oh, that's easy. Jason, finally stupid enough. Only if you use a stupid enough parser. Eval is not a stupid enough parser. 
W3 schools, which you shouldn't reference. Uh, list, here's how you do eval. Somewhere down at the bottom is actually saying don't use eval. Um, and it's also right there and just below it says don't use eval, even though it tells you to use eval. Uh, the lesson, beware of the flexibility of your system. Disable everything and just keep it simple. Thank you. Well, that there, that there was Katie McLaughlin presenting slides by Tom Eastman. Uh, that was originally a 30-minute talk. So uh, if you see Tom Eastman in the program tomorrow, you know that 25 minutes of the 30 that you'll be seeing will be him waffling rather than presenting essential information. <laughs> I actually recommend going to Tom's talk tomorrow. It's really, really good. Um, oh, sorry, on Sunday. Sunday. It's on Sunday. Sorry, Tom. Um, go to Tom's talk tomorrow when he won't be presenting. Uh, guaranteed. Uh, Tim McNamara, please come and get mic'd up. Uh, Marcus Holterman is going to be telling us about happiness packets. I got white slides. No, I don't. Um, these slides are actually not mine, and um, they are from uh, two people, two super awesome people from Europe, um, Eric, um, Eric Romain and Mike Ariel. Who knows? Hands up, who knows this kind of situation? Or who has been in this kind of situation? <laughs> Sucks, right? Um, now put yourself in the position of an open source contributor or an organizer of a conference or generally in the position of someone who does something for, for the community. How do you feel when you get a message like this? I feel totally overwhelmed, surprised and very, very grateful. Thank you for caring. Thank you for you are unbelievable. You are a bunch of craziest, the most positive people I've met. You inspire me to give back to community events even more. I wish I could express properly what I feel right now. May I always rain stroop waffles on you, but not all the time. That would be inconvenient. <laughs> Only when you feel like having stroop waffles or some, but someone that you feel that you like, uh, or someone that you feel like feels like having stroop waffles or you just want to make it rain stroop waffles. <laughs> Sending hugs, you crazy, amazing people. This is a message Eric received a while ago. He's a Django core developer and one of the organizers of Django Under the Hood in Amsterdam. When you receive such a message, you feel overwhelmed. You feel that someone, you've, something you have done actually mattered. The problem though, too few of us receive proper acknowledgement of the work they do. That is for different reasons. Openly expressing appreciation, gratitude, or happiness to other people can be difficult. This is especially true when you don't know them very well. Many of us come from cultures in which people are not open by default about feelings and naturally feel uncomfortable or even creepy to share them. As a result of that, Eric and Mikey created happinesspackages.io. Open source happiness packages is a very simple platform to anonymously reach out to people that you appreciate or that or to whom you think or, uh, or to whom you are thankful for their open source contributions. Thanks to them and well, if you feel like sharing appreciation to somebody, use that tool. It's pretty awesome. Use the website. It's really, really helps people being involved in open source communities who get the other kind of messages all the time to actually realize that what they do matters. Thank you, Marcus. Um, uh, having been on the receiving end of a few happiness packets, uh, I can say it's, a, it's definitely an appreciated service. Um, so yes, if you appreciate people in open source, uh, go send them a happiness packet. Uh, up next is Tim McNamara, who is the last person on my list currently. I'm happy to take more, uh, more sign-ups for Lightning Talks tonight. If you have something to present, uh, come and line up. Otherwise, uh, we can finish early. But first, Tim McNamara. Kia ora, good afternoon, everybody. I uh, am Tim McNamara. I wanted to talk about how to connect with other Pythonistas here in New Zealand because I was also very inspired by Lucy's talk this morning. I just thought I would raise um, or ask people to raise their hands again. Um, who's Who's, com who's is here to PyCon for the first time? So one thing we didn't do was like give everyone like a round of applause for that. Because it's a really, really hard decision 
to say, I'm interested enough, A, to spend money, but my weekend and maybe even a weekday to convince other people or my family that I need to take my time to learn about something that I really enjoy and want to contribute, I want to develop myself. So in a sense, your own selfishness uh, is a really, really positive step. And I would like to open people's eyes to thinking that even though we're on the wrong side of the world and in the wrong time zone, uh, and we speak a funny accent and we don't know how to pronounce vowels, there are probably well over a thousand Python programmers in the country. Kiwi PyCon has been going since, you know, <laughs> most of this millennium. And uh, <laughs> that was supposed to engender more laughs, but it didn't. Um, so I just thought I'd go for a couple of hand raises again. Who here's from Auckland? Okay, well, awesome. Uh, Wellington? Christchurch? Dunedin? Okay, all of those, oh, Hamilton? <laughs> <laughs> Rock sure on the Tron. All sure right. there's another five or so of them in the room. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. So those cities already have very active, if not kind of fledgling, local meetup groups. And if you're kind of bursting at the seams, the way to inject yourself into or at least hover around the periphery of those communities would be probably the easiest way would probably be meetup.com. But my preference would actually be if you took another step further. Uh, and that's go to nzpug.org. You'll notice that the website for the conference is actually the website for this pug thing, which actually stands for the Python user group and existed before meetup.com. If you go into one of the menus, it will be there's a thing called a mailing list. <laughs> if you went to, uh, and, I, and I mean this quite seriously because uh, as someone who's organized with the Wellington and the Auckland meetups, we don't get people from the mailing list anymore. Everyone comes through meetup.com. It's pretty serious. So I want to invite everybody to invite themselves to the meetup, uh, to, to the mailing list, and actually start discussions there, and actually have personal connections with the people outside of the physical spaces. If you can't attend one, please remember that there are several hundred people reading your emails. And it's actually a really positive community. And the more we can get of stuff that's not just, oh, which, which Python implementation do I like? Or, you know, like, what is the ultimate testing framework? This kind of stuff is, in a sense, trivial and boring. Um, what I think would be amazing is if we could have more human to human kind of stuff. And uh, that was my big call for my few minutes. Thanks for the time. Thank you very much, Tim. Huh? You're lining up again? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, that was P-U-G. NZ Pug, like the dog. Um, ideas for lightning talks, vowel translations for the Aussies in the room, apparently. That done? Uh, no time, because we have Chris Main, who's going to present the, uh, li another lightning talk. Um, yes, so it's very selfish of me to stand up again, but um, in, I came to the 2012 uh, PyCon, um, having not written a line of Python in my life, um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. And one of the things I did then was I uh, stood up for lightning talks, and I said, you know, computing, teaching computing in schools, this is not the most exciting thing. How, how did we, what's happening in this thing? So one of the questions I asked was, who had a computer when they were a small child? And uh, if I could ask that again, there's been a lot of hand raising, who had a computer when they were, say, under 10? Um, and actually, that's slightly less than it was. In, in PyCon in 2008, everybody but three people in the audience had a computer when they were under 10. You know, this was just a thing. We've got here and taken the effort to come to Python. Our interest has been peaked by computing all of those things somehow. Um, and then my second question at the time was, why is it taught at school so, so dull? Why aren't they doing more interesting things? 
Um, obviously, I was completely naive, and, and I apologised at the time, speaking to teachers who were trying really hard in this area. Um, and since then, I've, I've done a little bit of um, helping some high schools do IT projects. Um, I've been helping a junior RoboCup team building some robots and uh, trying to fire off party poppers at the right time and never do that again. Your kids are very disappointed when it doesn't happen. Um, <laughs> fiddled with Arduinos and Pies, done all sorts of things around there. Um, and I've sympathised a lot more with teachers. Um, in the UK, recently, they've had a big review of teaching, and they almost came to a conclusion. They said, we should either stop teaching computing at high schools, because we're doing such a terrible job and putting off more people, or we should try and do something else. What they, one of the uh, things that they've, they've tried is they've said, right, we're going to hire 400 expert teachers, and they're going to go off and teach the other teachers and uh, see how that goes. Um, in New Zealand, I, at the last RoboCup, where uh, I was there, the person who sponsors the RoboCup nationally, he was the national chairman of the organisation, they said that, oh, we're teaching IT teachers. Last year we taught three. Three IT teachers got taught. Um, so, and then there's other problems in the New Zealand, in the New Zealand space, I think. Um, and my time is gone. Uh, one of the things, I did a quick look at the Ministry of Education stats, and um, we've only got 13 high schools with more than 2,000 people in them. In Dunedin, the average size high school is 550 kids. And the problem that that presents is um, it's very hard to justify expensive resources around IT teaching when you've got these tiny classes. Um, you know, even finding one IT teacher for each school is, is sometimes, you know, it's a really hard effort. Um, and also the courses at high school, the moment you get to high school, it's basically functioned around giving people a mark. Here's your GC, here's your school thing. They're doing really dull stuff, which is really sad. And my conclusion at the moment is that we're actually asking our IT teachers to do a very, very hard, if not impossible, job. Okay, if we're expecting them to learn some computing at schools, it's just it's impossible for the people to do it properly. Um, so my conclusion, and what I, why I'm talking a light and talk, is I, I've, I've met some interesting people already talking in this sphere, and I think there's a real desire to do this. But I think as an IT community, we have to actively help our children's teachers. That there's no other way that I can see, certainly in New Zealand, with the size issues we've got, that it can't be the community here helping teachers do more interesting teaching in that sphere. Um, and I think also as a community, we, act to act, we have to actively push um, for, for it to be treated in a different way, for IT not to be looked at as, as a tool to write my English assignments on, but actually to be considered a, a first-class subject that's interesting. Um, and I've also already talked, you know, could it be assessed in a different way, more like art, perhaps, where here's a profile that I do, here's my project, haven't I done some cool stuff? One minute. Um, I think there's a possibility that, you know, the idea of master teachers uh, could work, but you've always got that problem that, um, you know, I worked in the UK for a long time, and I could sit here and I could go across the river and work in the City of London and earn some money, or I could go and teach high school thing. We've sort of got this disconnect that it's going to be very difficult to do, um, and so I think that there has to be, you know, I've, I've heard some interesting ideas already today about how that could work. Um, but I think, I think really my point is that as a community, um, if we don't want to keep this sort of closed community where we sort of pass on our enthusiasm to just a small group of people, we really need to start considering how we do it. And at the moment, um, yeah, I, I think we need to start that conversation. So thank you very much for your patience. Let's go to the pub. Thank you very much. Well, given that I don't see a really long line of people lining up to give lightning talks, I think... Oh, your time is up, by the way. No, no, so that's, that's his time. Yeah. yeah, he's got to get off the stage now. Yeah, done. Great. Um, so, there is another round of lightning talks tomorrow at 4.20 again. Um, ideally, we'd like for that session to go like past 5.30, so we struggle to get to the dinner on time. That would be deeply appreciated, wouldn't it, Tommy? Yeah. So let's try and make tomorrow run late. Um, Lightning Talk sign-ups will be at the registration desk. Uh, so if you have something to talk about and you can fill five minutes, go and sign up. Um, well, sure, do five lots of one minute on different topics. Yeah. Ooh. Um, so, uh, before I hand over to Tommy, let's just give another round of applause to all of our Lightning Talk presenters.